You know, I've been a leader in trying to prevent the expansion of San Quentin for a death row, which it would be bringing uh, barbed wire right to the edges of Sir Francis Drake, building six-story tall warehouses for prisoners, putting 10,000 watt light towers along the highway. And I'm very pleased that after 10 years, we were successful in getting the governor to not expand death row and completely cover the San Quentin site in development. I also think that as we look to the future, it is going to be important to think about where are the appropriate places for future development that don't impact our neighborhoods, that do reinforce programs like the SMART program, bus, rail, bike, pedestrian, do have beautiful shorelines, provide environmental protection, quit the dredging at $5 million every three years just to keep the Larkspur Ferry open. So I think it is a site that's appropriate, but I also think it's a site that is appropriate for a shared use. We have a magnificent community that cares about the population in San Quentin. We want to see a continued presence of an urban prison. So there is an opportunity for a shared use there. Um, uh, the San Quentin facility is a very, very old facility. There will come a day when the state probably decides to close it. So we definitely need to have a plan in place. Uh, in 2003, the county came up with a vision plan for San Quentin. Uh, I wish there had been more input from the community. Uh, there was a member uh, that was selected by the San Quentin uh, uh, Village uh, Homeowners Association who was denied uh, a place on the task force. Uh, in favor of a hand-picked uh, candidate uh, from Supervisor Kinsey. Another problem with that vision plan was that a lot of talk happened with regard to traffic, especially regarding the traffic from 580 to 101. This is a huge issue. And the tr task force discussed it at length, but guess what, it didn't make it in the ultimate report. So I think we need to go back, we need to have community input, we need to make sure decisions about any Fast tracking of development does not wind up on a consent calendar. We deserve absolute community participation in the decision. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Diane. The ABAG SB 3C75 housing question. So with the constraints we have of land, the constraints we have of county land, because that's really where you guys get to make those decisions, what is your proposal to meet the needs of housing that we have in the county? Well, I'm concerned that the ABEG staff doesn't understand what the constraints and opportunities are in our individual towns and in the, the county. Um, in Corte de Madera, we are built out. We're only three square miles. Our RENA housing allocation was 244 housing units for this last round. That was twice what Fairfax got. So, Fairfax, you know, good job on housing, but we were allocated twice that. We fulfilled it by putting in a high density development at the Wing Cup site. I don't think there was a single board member that wanted to vote for high density there, but we had to meet our housing mandates, so we did. We did that to avoid a lawsuit. Um, you know, we don't have another Wing Cup site up our sleeve, and in Corte de Madera, we are working really hard to come up with a Marin-based solution, whether it's a Marin Council of Governments or some other way for the cities and the county to get together to help decide what are our constraints, where are our opportunities, how are we going to meld housing and jobs and transportation, because I think Marin knows better than Agbag. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's one thing to talk about your town, and it's one thing to say what you don't want. It's really more important for our future that we all think about what we do need to have to address this issue of regional growth. And I think that in our county, we've done a remarkable job of planning the county to have a strong protection for our coast, keep our agricultural and central areas, and rely on the 101 corridor as a framework for future development. I think that organizing our future development to be close to bus transit, to be close to rail transit, to take advantage of shopping centers with large open parking areas to mix in mixed use, mixed income housing, to encourage second units in the neighborhoods are all things that we can do to address the housing needs of the county as a whole. And I think that every community has an opportunity and a responsibility to take that forward. I do believe we've been successful in making our case to ABEG because we were given only 1% of the total Bay Area expected future growth over the next 30 years. 
Thank you. Uh, would you like one minute closing, Diane, you can start? Okay. Um, on, for, for the foreseeable future, finances are going to be the issue in the county. We've got reduced funding from the state and from the uh, federal government. Property taxes are, are slow to rebound from the economic uh, downturn. I've got 13 years experience in accounting and finance. I worked really hard when I got on the council in Corte Madera to turn down years of deficit spending to a now with balanced budget. Um, Mr. Kinsey said earlier that, that Corte Madera has ne not taken steps to deal with pension and health care costs. That is untrue. We have, have increased the amount that the employees pay and we, we've really made, made very solid cuts in the retiree health care costs. Um, it's time for a change. Elected officials are not supposed to be on indefinitely. Our democracy is set up so that elected officials come and elected officials go. Since we don't have term limits in this county, it's up to the voters to decide when it's time for some change. I, for one, think we are ready for some change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the district, as I said, is diverse. It's very expansive. It has a whole range of issues that needed to be that need to be addressed. It's been a privilege to continue to work with so many different parts of the community, and we need to continue to do that. We have kept our county fiscally sound, and that gives us the opportunity to do many things going forward. In my time in public service, whether it was for the 15 years before I was an elected uh, supervisor or during my time as an elected supervisor. I've been able to be a leadership role, play a leadership role in many important things. Our water supply for our county, our transportation systems, and finding a way to find consensus to fund transportation improvements, helping to establish improvements in our child care, our preschool, our services for seniors, families. These are things that I've done as a supervisor, will continue to do. I'm a creative problem solver, a good listener. I work at the nexus of problems within the community to find solutions, and I'd like to keep doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minutes. Sure, yeah, thank you very much, Ed. It's nice to join all of you tonight, and nice to do it from a familiar seat. This is where I sit at all of our city council meetings. Um, I'm running for assembly because Sacramento is broken. Um, you know, nothing really gets done there because the special interests have the state capital in a stranglehold. <laughs> and we need now more than ever a local voice, a strong local voice to represent us, someone who understands our communities. My wife and I are raising our children here in this community. We're, you know, very involved in, in both San Rafael but Marin County as a whole uh, for many years. And we have struggled with our city, but also our community members during very <coughs> difficult times. That's a perspective, uh, an authentic perspective, that we need to have uh, speaking out for us in Sacramento. My experience at the local level is the perfect preparation for what we need to do at the state capitol. We've done a lot of really good things. We've promoted clean energy, recycling, curbside composting, pension reform, all here at the local level that a lot of things, you know, here in Sacramento or over there in Sacramento haven't been addressed. Uh, so we've done a lot that translates here locally, that's practical, that we should be bringing to Sacramento. You know, what we see in the race before us is essentially a power play by Sacramento in a turned out district to put someone else here who's not from here, hasn't been struggling with us on local issues, uh, and force someone else into this district. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't think that we had homegrown candidates who could represent our own voice. We actually can do that and represent ourselves. We can go to Sacramento and reduce the power of special interests. We have to stick up for ourselves. I'm very hopeful, I'm not naive, we've got uh, over 40 new legislators coming to the assembly next year, that we can change the culture in Sacramento where things aren't getting done and haven't been done very well and do them much better. We can do better. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Michael Allen. Thank you. Um, I was reading tonight uh, the values for the, the Marin uh, Women's Political Pack, and I just want to talk about a little bit about my experience. 
Um, I'm very proud that I'm with the co-founder of the Living Wage Movement up in Sonoma County. I've been in the North Bay for over 40 years, working in Sonoma County and in Marin County, very active with the Smart Train, uh, very active in transportation issues. I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to establish a child care center uh, 25 years ago that's still in, in the functioning, which is a public-private partnership. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that when I started working uh, years ago as a labor attorney that I was able to uh, take a situation where women were excluded from the civil service system and pensions because they excluded all the part-timers who were primarily women. And I was able to argue to get them civil service protection and pensions that they deserved. I've been uh, supported in the past and endorsed by Planned Parenthood. I've been uh, an advocate for women's rights. Um, I have a breastfeeding bill right now that is enjoying support in the legislature, 2386, uh, to um, clarify the rights of women in the workplace to breastfeed. Um, I'm very proud that uh, last year I, I voted for and uh, uh, argued on the floor for the uh, provisions that provide women with uh, health care when they go off on pregnancy leave to extend those. So um, I'm uh, 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 a child of a Latina uh, seamstress, a uh, single mom who raised me. I appreciate those values, and I think that I would represent this district well. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Christian Gunderson. Hi, can you hear me? Um, yeah, my name is Dr. Christian Gunderson. I have been a doctor for 26 years. And one of the main reasons I'm running is basically, as a doctor, if you can turn around and help 10, 20,000 people in your career, you're doing a really good job. But if you do one decent thing in Sacramento, or stop one bad thing from happening in Sacramento, you could help 37 million people. So that's primarily the, the main reason I'm running, is as a doctor, is as a healer. Second reason I'm running is we spend too much time watching TV, and these politicians are basically putting the party way ahead of anything else. You got the party, you got getting money, you got satisfying everybody who basically endorses them, and somewhere down in the lower realm, the people come about. The people who actually vote for you. So on a scale of one to ten, it'd be nice if the people were first instead of seven. A couple ideas real fast. One, I'd like to cap credit card rates at 20% and have 25% of the fees go to local schools. And one idea would raise billions of dollars. I would like to turn around and have <coughs> California certify Canadian websites. That way, if you go online and you want to save 50 to 80 percent off your medications, you know it's the exact same thing as walking across the street to Long's and picking up your meds. <coughs> There's a lot of different ways of helping. The thing about Sacramento is the thing about I'm sorry. The thing about Marin is Marin is the leader. We are the leader of California. California is the leader of this nation. If we decide to do something, it doesn't only affect us. It can affect the entire world if we choose to make it happen. But to do that, you have to find solutions. I'm a doctor. You come to me for a problem, my whole goal is to get you out of pain. Thank you. Alex Easton Brown. <coughs> can you hear me? Yeah, no, push the green button. button. Great, okay. In 1890, the populist Mary Elizabeth Lee said, Wall Street owns the country. The political parties lie, and the political speakers mislead us. <coughs> Obama climbed into bed with Wall Street, selling out the middle class. They left the Pentagon and CIA waged their illegal wars. Most recently, 300 innocent women and children killed with his drones. Obama, Obama cynically pursued the failed war on drugs, his cops cheering up the weakest and poorest members of society, destroying families and branding citizens for the rest of their lives. My wife Diane, after teaching at San Quentin for three years, was transferred to the women's prison in Stockton. Most of these women were women of color, ripped from their families for minor drug offenses, often just by association with their boyfriends or husbands. Their children were left parentless to be further chewed up by the system. 850,000 people arrested in California for minor possession of marijuana. When is this madness going to stop? Our politicians, who are just traffickers of power, have stuffed their pockets with corporate cash and allowed the prison industrial complex to grow like a cancer, devouring funds for education. 
Obama lets Wall Street borrow money from the Fed at 0% interest to speculate on oil futures, costing us an extra dollar a gallon. It's a $16 trillion giveaway to the biggest banks, while 4 million people lost their homes and 11 million more are about to. Roosevelt refinanced tens of thousands of homes. He put millions to work, built 650,000 miles of highway, 124,000 bridges, 8,000 parks, 18,000 playgrounds, and 125,000 public buildings. Obama's failure is not that these programs don't work, but that they haven't been tried. Next, Connie Wong. Good evening, my name is Connie Wong, and I'm your neighbor from Fort Madera. I've been a resident of Marin since 1977. I'm a mother of an eight-year-old who goes to one of our public schools. I'm an active Marin realtor, and I'm also a military officer. So I served for 18 years, and I'm still serving in the California National Guard in the rank of major. Uh, actually, that's why I'm running. Um, I blew the whistle in the military. I've watched, I was the chief of equal opportunity for the last five years, and I watched them break every single equal rights and civil rights law there is, and I'm not gonna tolerate it anymore. So I'm here to fight for that. I'm here to fight for government transparency and accountability, because there isn't any. Second reason why I'm running for our office is because of our state deficit. Um, in order to clean that up, can't be doing business as usual. We need to think outside the box, which includes creating a state-owned bank, run like the, uh, the Bank of North Dakota. If I don't win, that's okay. Do me and you and our grandchildren a huge favor. Please Google Bank of North Dakota when you get home today. Okay? We need to copy them and do what they're doing. They're the only state in the union that has stayed in the black for the, throughout the recession. Their balance sheet is so good, they've given back $400 million um, in income tax and uh, property tax credits. So let's be like them. They're, I mean, who wants to be in debt? Not me. And uh, my last issue that I'm running on is um, the environment. We are literally killing ourselves with air pollution by driving our vehicles on one of them. Um, and again, if I don't win, please vote for, or, or for your next vehicle. Um, buy a fuel cell vehicle. Buy, uh, it runs on hydrogen, it burns clean. It's real, it's possible. How many of you remember the flux capacitor from uh, back in the future? Yeah, it's real. And it's called a fuel cell, thank you. The next candidate isn't here, his name's Joe Boswell. When he comes in, we'll hear from him. Um, I know there's another event tonight, so he's probably over there. Uh, the first question will be will go to Mark from Gina. Hi. Um, is the legislation legis yeah the legislator legislation capable? No. Legislature. <laughs> is the legislature capable of functioning efficiently? What would it take? What would you do with only one person? How can you avoid being beholden to special interests? Yeah, Gina, that's such a topical question. Uh, I, I mentioned this earlier, I'm not naive about this, but I am incredibly hopeful that when we have 40 new members elected in November, uh, a majority of the assembly changed uh, at a time when we have open primaries, new districts, um, that there could be a culture change in Sacramento at a time where the governor is going to be asking us to all vote for a tax increase at the ballot, we need to find a way to restore trust between the legislature and the voters. Voters will be hesitant to support a tax increase if they don't trust the legislature and the governor to actually do the right thing. And I think it, it really calls into question how do you build that trust as a legislator, I will be you know, going out into the community asking people you know, to, to, to build a relationship so that we can have that trust back again. I think it calls into question the ethics of our legislators. Do they reach that highest level of ethics that people are expecting of us? Are they there to serve the people? Or do we walk into our city halls or the state legislature to serve ourselves? And that's an important question that we need to ask anyone who's running for office. Dr. Thunderson, you can go next. I'm sorry, uh, what was the question again? Is the legislature 
capable of functioning efficiently, what would it take? What would you do as only one person to make it more efficient, and how can you avoid being beholden to special interests? Well, I mean, one of the things that um, Ren is really lucky about is Jared Huffman. I mean, he may not agree with all of his policies, but for the last six years, he's done a really good job. He's basically done, what, 60 good bills. Some of them really, really good, some of them not so good. But at least he's one person that's had vision and actually done something. Now, if you compare him to Michael here, Michael's a very nice guy, but the bills that Michael authors in comparison are nowhere near as visionary. They don't affect as many people, and they're not as profound. So there is an opportunity for someone in legislature to actually step up and make a profound difference. Jared Huffman has done it in a number of ways. Michael hasn't. So the question is, who do you want to be like? Do you want to be like Jared, or do you want to be like somebody else? I choose to be like Jared. I've already basically asked um, his employees that if I'm elected, would they like to work for me? Thank you. Michael? Yes, uh, when I was elected 16 months ago, uh, we faced a $28 billion deficit, a uh, structural deficit. After our first year in office, not only were we the first legislature in a decade to reach a budget on time, but we ended up with a structural deficit in the area of $9 billion, so we made incredible progress. In my first three months in office, um, I was elected as the assistant majority leader to provide leadership. Do I believe the legislature is functional? Yes, could be much better, absolutely. The, um, the change to a majority vote uh, for, to adopt a budget was a positive move. We've hamstrung ourselves by having a two-thirds requirement to be able to raise revenues. I was one of the caucus members who suggested to Governor Brown at the very beginning of my first term that we should have gone for this measure for education much earlier, and not wait to try to get Republican votes. Most of what has been done to the legislature has been done by all of us in terms of the reforms that we've done. And essentially, the legislature operates within the parameters of the way it's been set up. So my answer is, we are responsible to a large degree for the function of the legislature. It's not a matter of personality, it's a matter of structural restraints. And I am confident that the performance of the legislature is uh, going to uh, essentially, in, in the future, uh, meet the challenge to rebuild California. Um. I've always wanted to meet this man, but I never had the opportunity. Um, but I would, I would be like the late supervisor, Mr. Hal Brown. Um, I would build consensus between the parties. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, I'm financing my own campaign, so I don't have to be beholden to anybody. Um, as an example, of, actually, I've taken one contribution from my mentor, Basha Crane. There she sits. And I, I just had to do it because she's been always there for me uh, as my YouTube mentor. A um, hundred years ago, uh, just a couple blocks from here, my grandfather, Horace Brown, and uh, Congressman Kent met right before they were elected as progressives, Republican progressives, um, to make some serious change in the way this country is run, the way the state of California is run. And, uh, Hiram Johnson took uh, my grandfather up to Sacramento as corporate commissioner to clean, to throw Sac uh, Southern Pacific out of the legislature. And they were able to do that. And it did, people did it, the legislature did this because the need was so great, it didn't take a lot of convincing. And I think change now is so essential that I don't see much problem in us creating a, a new way of doing things. Next question will go to Michael Allen from Michelle Varney. Okay. The um, state of California is in dire straits and is cutting funding of schools, increasing tuition for colleges and universities, limiting the number of students who can go to the colleges and universities, threatening the closure of state parks, and cutting teachers and law enforcement personnel. Do you think it is wise at this time for the state of California to continue to pursue projects such as the development of high-speed rail train from San Francisco to LA, which would cost billions of dollars. What do you think the priorities of California should be with limited funds? 
The absolute priority for California needs to be twofold. Number one, education, and that's why I supported the Middle Class uh, Tuition Act, which would essentially help middle class uh, kids be able to afford college. Uh, it's why I'm, I'm supporting the governor's proposal for the revenues for K through 12 and for public safety. Public safety, education are the two priorities. With the high-speed rail, uh, there's been a new business plan developed. I think the, I support high-speed rail. However, I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, the long-term funding for it is problematic. There's been some discussions regarding using the existing rail to tie into high speed so that we can do it cheaper. But in terms of building infrastructure for California, whether it's, it's um, intellectually uh, from our educational facilities or whether it's the railroads or build, rebuilding our roads or, or those things that we need uh, for our society, uh, we need to do them in order for California to be successful. Uh, I wouldn't cut any of our um, programs. We need them. I'm a believer of uh, keeping programs and not taxing the poor, the disabled, the you know middle class. Um, I am confident of doing this because what we really need to do is start a state-owned bank like the Bank of North Dakota. Bank of North Dakota's balance sheet is so great that they've given back money to their uh, citizens and um, we, need to, we need to use them as a template. We need to, California needs to get out of business, excuse me, California needs to get into business in order to um, stay in business. Right now we are spiraling deeper into debt, like Michael said, we're $28 billion um, and, and continuing. So we have to make money, we have to have revenues to um, pay for these things, and I think we can do that with a state-owned bank. We would be making, um, I think it was 1,166 times whatever the Bank of North Dakota is making. Thank you. Alex? We can impose a half percent uh, financial transaction tax, Robin Hood tax. We can pay Californians for their mineral resources that belong to them with an oil and gas severance tax. We can charge a hugely profitable oil company to do business in California, an excess profits tax. We can fund education. We can fund single payer. We can fund infrastructure, roads, bridges, and schools. We can fund Planned Parenthood. It is shown to be a fallacy that businesses will move out of state if they are taxed. We can go after the offshore profits, the Swiss bank accounts, and stashed Cayman Island cash. We can seize the foreclosed homes that are blighting our neighborhoods and threatening our public order. There is a California bank. It's called the State Infrastructure Development Bank. We can use this bank to create infrastructure jobs, much, much like Roosevelt. We can use the infrastructure bank to fix up these blighted homes and, fix, and rent them out or rent to own to families at affordable prices. So there's a lot of ways we can uh, solve the problems in California. Mark? I think uh, as Democrats, we have a lot of shared values in education. I think we need a recommitment to the California Master Plan for Higher Education. I had been during a period where we've had seats reduced for students who qualify to go on to higher ed. Um, access to health care, of course, is also a shared value. I think the point here is if we're asking people for more revenue in the form of a tax initiative to help support all the things that we want to prioritize, how can they trust us? And, when we were dealing with the $20 billion deficit last year, uh, in fact, the legislature did not pass a budget on time. It was late. Although, Michael Allen said it was on time, it was late. And the controller withheld their pay. And now we have another $9 billion deficit. And what the assembly is doing now is suing the controller to stop him from being able to withhold their pay. Essentially, what we voted for in Prop 25 in 2010, you can pass a budget with a majority but if you don't do it on time, you don't get paid. So if we're going to go asking for new revenue, how can they trust us when we're doing this and not facing our problems face on? Uh, it's very troubling for me to think that we're going to go to voters asking for that revenue without being responsible to them. Christian? I'm just waiting for her to blow the whistle. <laughs> um, as far as education, uh, like I said before, when I, um, basically cap player, credit card rates at 20%, uh, have 25% of the finance charges go to local schools. That one idea would raise billions for local schools and also free up a lot of money for the state. I would also turn around 
And basically, um, in Marin, we have what, uh, 19 school districts, and Sonoma County, we have 46. I would definitely reduce the amount of school districts to cut overhead. I'd rather the money go to kids and um, teachers. I've talked to uh, the president of SSU. One of the things he brought up is, guess what, it costs $42,000 to throw somebody in jail for a year. And we're basically turning around and, and what, $7,000? When I've talked to the various school superintendents, their whole goal isn't to be number one out of 47. Their goal is to be number 25. I mean, how sad is this? We're the richest country in the world. We are in the best state and we're in the best area. And the goal of our officials in school is to be number 25, not to be number one. We're supposed to be the leaders. So the question is, who are we going to lead? Are we going to lead the uneducated, the unemployed, or are we going to lead people can, that can step up? I'm still waiting for the whistle. <laughs> the last question, Tammy, would you direct it to Dr. Christensen, or Gunderson first, please? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'll ask her to blow the whistle. Please. Um, so job creation, unemployment in California is a big issue. And one of the things that we talk about, and it was an issue that came up in, in Marin County, was a new target was being proposed here in Santa Fe and has actually been approved. Is that the type of jobs that we want to have created? Or do we want to have jobs that provide livable wages and benefits so that we don't have to continue to provide safety nets to people who have jobs but aren't really fully employed and, and aren't able to actually sustain their lifestyle? Jobs is important. Guess what? You have to have jobs to feed your family. You know, it's kind of like one of the things where you go, yes. Um, one of the things I would like to do is, if you turn around and you go to like B of A, Wells Fargo, and you put in $100, within six months they have to turn around and do 25% of that in small business loans. Biggest problem right now is banks are sitting on $2 trillion. There's not enough money to start small business. California is really good at, we are really good at small business. I would turn around and cut regulations. I'd go to the people who actually know which regulations to cut and help business. One of the things I'm for right now is saving Drake's Bay Oyster Company. It's been around for 70 years. It provides $2 million for local economy. It's about as environmentally friendly as you can get. We are attacking the very people that we should be helping, like George Lucas, like uh, Drake's Bay. We need to basically pull back and go, okay, this helps. We have to balance making a living with environment. Um, I personally do not like Target. I really don't like Walmart. I think you're... It says 30 seconds. It says 30 seconds. They should have this wrong side. Did you give me the wrong side? That means you're something clock for 30 seconds. No, it's not this side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't like Walmart. They're the reason we're in this mess. So okay. okay, Michael, the same question. Um, I've been in the part of big box retailers for the, for the reason that basically destroys local business. Um, the, essentially, uh, we have to have local business to be viable long term and not depend on companies that have um, very long distance supply chains and also essentially destroy the, the local economy. Um, last year, uh, for small business, I sponsored a uh, jobs uh, tax credit it was supported unanimously by all Democrats and Republicans. That was part of the, the governor's jobs package. Uh, I've also supported uh, getting rid of the single sales tax factor, which would bring more jobs to California by eliminating uh, the uh, corporate loophole for corporations out of state. So um, I, I think that essentially um, we can do a lot to uh, stimulate the economy by essentially uh, making sure we have the money for education and having the money for infrastructure improvements that we need to make over the next few years. Uh, I too am a, a, I'm a small business uh, proponent. I, what, I own my own small business here uh, in San Antonio in 2009 to 2011 and had I uh, been able to have more access to credit um, I think I would have stayed in business and again so I'm, I'm going back to my state-owned bank idea we really need to get into that because the Bank of North Dakota, guess what? They take their state revenues and they lend it out to their own people. They don't take that money and send it out to Wall Street, okay? Where, where you know, we only get, what, 0.001% in return and Wall Street gets to keep the profits? No, the money goes back into the state 
and we can lend that money out to those to the small small businesses that are the bank, or excuse me, are the backbone of our country. That's what we need to be investing in ourselves, not in some third world country for this and that. We need to bring that money home and use it for um, for our businesses, for our homes here. Loan out money to our homes, and thank you. <coughs> I already told you about the millions of jobs that FDR created pretty much on an experimental basis. He says, we've got to try something. You know, uh, Huey Long, I'm going to paraphrase him. I don't want a stinking South Belly rice and bean. Um, here we go. I always crack up when I read this. Um, I don't want a stinking South Belly rice and bean minimum wage job. I want a new suit of clothes, a new car in my garage, a Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Jesus Christ, red, white, and blue, real job. Mark? That's hard to follow. Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, we, we, we have a sophisticated economy, and, and I think it needs to be diverse. And if you look at, for example, a business that many of us really look up to and, and I find creates really delicious food is Amy's Organics in Sonoma, a great employer, great maker of food, $10 million revenue stream out of a business like Target, um, and it supports the, our local economy um, there at, at Amy's Organics. And if you look at where we had, ended up actually having Target, it's a community that, if you look at the Marin Community Foundation's portrait of Marin, lives eight years fewer, a lot of years. Uh, in their lives than people that live just down the road, down Sir Francis Drake. Um, the kids at the two schools in that neighborhood uh, are 100% on free lunch programs at the two elementary schools. So I think there's a place in our economy in Marin for everyone, and it's something that we can you know, understand has a, a place for, for us to shop at the village or in Corte Madera where they're building out another 20,000 square feet at Nordstrom and another 17,000 square feet at Macy's. Uh, that there's, there is somewhere, something for everyone. But we do need to have also the Grady Ranches uh, in our community as well, so that we have the jobs where we can actually afford to live here, um, and that also uh, has uh, you know people that want to shop here too. Thank you. The panelists want to ask one more question, and we'll start with Alex Easton Brown. Okay. Um, speaking of businesses like um, Walmart and Target and that. Uh, should businesses be responsible for paying livable wages and benefits to their employees so that taxpayers do not have to foot the bill for expensive so social programs aimed at helping the working poor? Yes. If I have another half a minute, I'd like to say something. Uh, you know, the supervisors totally blew it on this George Lucas deal. Uh, they can't tie their own shoes without hiring a consultant, and they sure blew it. Uh, I wrote a letter to George Lucas' foundation suggesting that they take this property and use it for a woman's institute. Now what this woman's institute would do would be correlate all these studies that are remain uncorrelated throughout the country internationally on women's health. There's Susan uh, Love's uh, 860,000 woman participant uh, breast cancer study and it has yet to be coordinated with all the other studies. A woman's institute would benefit the county and benefit women. Yeah, I think we absolutely have to push for those things. And I, I have asked the Santa Fe City Council to take up a living wage ordinance and to study that. I, I don't know if the council will get to it. We have a long list of things on the agenda, and I've asked for it to be at the very top. Uh, but we'll, we'll see where it gets. Um, as a charter city, I think that we have a lot of uh, room to do something and show leadership. Um, but I think when we do have projects, particularly construction projects, it's important that they do pay a living wage, provide benefits. Um, on uh, Target in particular, that is going to be union construction. They've signed with Whiting and Turner, Turner which is a union signatory. Um, and so that's going to be a very positive thing for the construction uh, sector, which has 25% unemployment right now. And those will be good jobs. Dr. Gunderson. Yeah, a living wage is really, really important. Um, basically, um, in Marinwa, it's about uh, a little over $10. Uh, for um, basic uh, wage. Um, biggest problem, it needs to be county by county and maybe even city by city um, because if you're in Fresno, uh, living, may, living wage may be a little bit lower. Here in Marin, guess what? Costs a little bit more. Sonoma County is a little bit different. 
So this needs to be basically a local idea and a local vision and empowered by local. One of the things I've really enjoyed about being a part of this whole process is talking to the people, talking to the police chiefs, talking to the city administrators, and basically go, okay, what can I do to help? Nine times out of ten, they basically say, hey, if you go to Sacramento, leave us alone. <laughs> or if you want anything, make sure you pay for it. So on anything like this, we have to go to the people who know most about our area. Thank you very much. Michael? Yes, um, I fought for 15 years for the living wage in Sonoma County, and I continued uh, that kind of work when I went to the Capitol. One of the first bills I sponsored was an earned uh, income tax credit for the, for the working poor that would have uh, absolutely helped uh, working families and children uh, come out of poverty. Um, I um, support uh, um, an increase to the minimum wage and indexing of the minimum wage. If the minimum wage would have been indexed at the time it was created, the minimum wage would be 18.38 or something an hour. If you factored in productivity, it'd be over $25 an hour. Uh, uh, I also this year am sponsoring a bill for the farm workers. Uh, after 75 years, I think it's time our agricultural workers are given the same dignity of overtime for working over 40 hours that uh, most everyone else in our society has. And, uh, I'm uh, the author of that bill, and I'm proud of carrying it. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think we should have uh, living wages, but uh, we need to be careful. We need to balance that with, um, you know, making sure that we don't scare away small businesses. Otherwise, we're going to attract those big targets, you know. And um, we, yeah. most of the people who work at Target aren't from. They're not from here. Um, I've been campaigning, and the people. People I've been talking to, I ask them, where are you from, where are you from? They're all from the East Bay. Uh, they commute in, in, into Marin. Um, I don't know how, how many of you know that we have 61,000 commuters that come in here every day. It's clogging up our, our freeways. It's, they're polluting our air. And so we need to be careful to not drive away those small businesses with um, uh, you know, these high, high, you know, um, excuse me, high wages, high wage requirements. Otherwise, we're going to only have big box retailers who will um, attract people from outside of Marin and Sonoma coming into our, our, our community. Not that I, you know, I don't welcome them, but those are the people who our freeways are going to get clogged up and um, our air is going to continue to get polluted. Thank you. Okay, we'll have a one minute closing from each of you, starting with Mark and working down the road there. Yeah, thank you again for hosting us this evening. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to see many of you again and talk about uh, this assembly race. We have a choice here in Marin and Sonoma. We don't have to take what's being given to us by Sacramento. We have an important voice and views that need to be represented in Sacramento uh, so that we can break away from the special interests that are driving a lot of the decision making here. For example, we do need someone in Sacramento who will fight against a casino in Lunar Park, which would then cause downward pressure for another casino in Petaluma, and then we could have Casino Alley all the way up the 101 that would deplete the Sonoma County uh, groundwater basin. We need to have a voice that will actually bring together people from across the state to stand up for us, rather than the special interests that are over in Sacramento. I'm very hopeful. We have so many great things to do for our Golden State, so many things to do for our district. And I've loved working here for you in San Rafael. I'm going to be grateful for the opportunity to bring your voice to Sacramento. Thank you. The question is solutions. I'm for solutions. I'm not interested in party politics. I've been a Democrat all my life. But the question is, if somebody's out of work, do they really care whether it's a Republican job or a Democrat job or an independent job? No, they want to feed their families. California is broken. It's been broken for a while. We need people that are more interested in solutions than party politics. Or we need people more willing to actually do something and break the gridlock and have transparency than basically pretend that everything's okay. And now we're, you know, every couple of years basically say, hey, yeah, it's broken, but never mind. We'll put it off. We'll put it off. We'll put it off. It's time to change. It's past time to change. We need to fix the problems now. I've been a doctor for 26 years. It's my greatest joy in life is to get people out of pain. 
California is in pain. I'm for solutions, wherever they come from. I'm for business. I'm for the environment. I'm for balance. And I'm for choice. My name is Dr. Christian Gunners. Thank you very much. In closing, uh, I bring over 40 years of achievement as a community activist. Uh, when I came to Sacramento, uh, the leaders there, folks from every area of California, voted me to be the assistant majority leader as a leader. Um, I did vote for a state bank my first term to governor. The governor did veto it. Uh, despite what was said to you tonight, we did have a budget on time. The constitutional deadline is June 30th. Our, our, our budget was um, uh, vetoed by the governor on June 15th. Uh, although uh, it's phrased as a, an issue about wages uh, for the legislators, what it really is is that right now we have constitutional officers that are all Democrats. What happened if in the executive branch we had Republicans who decided independently that we did not have a balanced budget? Uh, short-circuiting the relationship between the, the legislature and the governor. It's best left between the legislature and governor as to whether we have a balanced budget or not. Uh, I bring experience, I bring maturity, I bring energy, and I bring a will to complete my next two terms, God willing. And thank you all for coming tonight. Closing, I just want to say thank you for, to everyone for listening tonight. Um, again, I, if you send me up there, I would fight for a state-owned or county-owned bank. Um, and also, or we, California needs to put its non-performing uh, funds into buying real estate and generating income, monthly income to pay for our expenses from um, income producing properties. Or we need to legalize marijuana and tax the hell out of it so that, uh, you know, we can, we can pay for our, our expenses. We can't continue to, to run, uh, you know, in the red. We just can't be running on credit. We have no credit. We're done. Um, it, it's coming up soon, so uh, please send me up there because you know I'm motivated, I'm passionate, and uh, I want to represent you. Thank you. Now, I've been a house husband for 25 years. This happened because my wife wanted to pursue her educational career yet have a baby, so I raised the child. It's been a very joyous uh, experience. It also worked with me building my own house at the same time and doing social research. But I can tell you as a house husband, that job is worth about $70,000 a year. And, uh, you know, this minimum wage thing, France pays $13 an hour, Australia pays $16 an hour. This country really wants to sit on top of the two-thirds of the people that make this country work. And it's a sin. And uh, as a house husband, um, I found a lot of joy in what I do. There's nothing more noble than doing housework, washing dishes, and cleaning. I know it sounds like great, crazy stuff, but um, I find a lot of joy. It's a very zen experience, and I take a lot from it. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for joining tonight. Now, if you're a member, would you please stay and we'll caucus? And uh, everyone else, please. Head to the uh, the lobby.